Herzlich willkommen, warm welcome to week 11 of Café Stillpoint. My name is Anja Engel Schulmeier. I'm the coordinator for the Women's Health Course in Vienna and head of the postgraduate department of Vienna School of Osteopathy. Today, I guess we have an international audience, so I will stick to English. Before we will start, I'd like to invite you to ask questions during the lecture of Renzo. That means that you can just type in your questions into Skype and I will read them out or read them to Renzo. So we can be a little more interactive. So you are welcome to ask. Good. Now I like to introduce our special guest for tonight, Professor Renzo Molinari from London. And Renzo is the principal of the Molinari Institute of Health and he is one of the former principals of the European School of Osteopathy. He is a friend, he is a passionate osteopath, he is a mentor, and most important, he is a man who is able to understand women much better than they can do themselves. So hello to London, hello Renzo. Hello Anya. It's nice How are to you? see you healthy <laughs> and very Brown or tent is the word in English. So nice to have you here. Nice to meet you in the cafe for a virtual drink. Yes, tonight. I would like to do it, but our cafes are already open. I think in London it's still closed. Or... Yes, absolutely. Oh, your cafes are open. You're lucky. Yes. It's what we're missing here. Our restaurants as well. So maybe you should come to Vienna as oh. I always suggest. Yes, absolutely. But I will be put in quarantine, you know. <laughs> Not if you have a negative test. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yes. I'm negative. <laughs> I'm sure. So, Renzo, your title for today is a little bit a tribute to Sigmund Freud, who was living in Vienna as well as in London, as I learned. And yes. the title is what woman wants. That's the question Sigmund was struggling his whole life to get an answer of. So I'm yes. very excited to get answers from you in the next hour. <laughs> well, you know, if Sigmund Freud didn't find the an answer to this question, I will not even try. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you said that I understand women. I, I try, but I don't think I'm succeeding because I never know what they want. <laughs> but, but maybe I know you what know they what they need. need. I, exactly. I know what they need and I know what they need for women's health. And that is osteopathy, of course. And uh, it's what I would like to talk about tonight. Yes. From going back to steel and looking a bit how osteopathy has evolved in this field. Yes. Okay, we are really excited. If you like, you can start already with your presentation. Okay, so I will go to my presentation. So what what I want to do is to go back to to the beginnings, to what Andrew Taylor still was saying, and even try to understand why why he created osteopathy. Because you know, very often everybody re, uh, repeats, repeats the same thing, that he lost many children and his wife, he lost six children with uh, an epidemic, of course it was terrible, but his students and uh, Connor in particular are reporting and he is reporting to that, that is not totally true. In fact, what was the real trigger what the birth, the birth of a little boy. His wife and his son had a very difficult time to come. And uh, that was the trigger for his attention to women's health and to obstetrics from day one. And you know, what is interesting, it's to realize that when he founded the school in 1892, he of course, he registered a charter for the American School of Osteopathy. And this charter specifies the objectives of the school. And the second objective is to teach an improved obstetrical approach. And that for him was a focal point of 
his whole approach to look at obstetrics and gynecology and to help women. And I will come back on that, help women, because that was really a focus of Andrew Taylor Steele. If we look at the USA at the time, the, the beginning was very discreet. It was, a, as you know, a very small little wooden school. And at the same time, uh, you know, he had to ask $500 to set up his school. At the same time, the government of Kansas gave $5 million to set up a medical school. So you can see the difference there. But what happened in the United States is interesting. When you look at the situation today, a vast, vast majority of osteopathic physicians practice medicine. They practice medicine and they say with a philosophy that is osteopathy, but they practice medicine. 60% of them are primary care practitioners. They work in hospitals and many of them are pediatrician or obstetrician or gynecologist. But what is interesting, it's to realize that they practice medicine on a daily basis. If we look in Europe, how osteopathy started in mainland Europe is very interesting because in fact, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, uh, osteopathy had a very mechanistic understanding. Uh, and that is, I believe, because of its origin and the people who transmitted osteopathy to start with. Uh, for example, you know, 45 years ago, approximately, during my education, uh, there was not a mention of obstetrics or gynecology. Nothing, not a word. And when I asked, what about obstetrics? What about pregnant women? I was told, you don't touch pregnant women because if there is any problem, you will be seen as responsible. Obviously, in the last 40, 50 years, things have evolved, things have changed. And uh, in fact, today, uh, a manual approach in gynecology is a practice in Europe, all around Europe. And for example, you know, we, we have our teaching clinic in London and the teaching clinic in Vienna also. They are exclusively devoted to women's health. And we, we have put together a complete system of education in women's health. And, uh, and I can tell you that there is an extremely high demand. I will come back on that. But what is interesting it's it's really interesting to, to look at Andrew Taylor Steele and his position towards women. For Steele, women were important. And I'm saying that, it, it seems like a joke. But if you go back 150 years, the situation of women was not at all what it is today. And you have to remember that the, the American School of Osteopathy was the first medical school, maybe in the world, accepting women. You know, the first women to be accepted in gynecological courses in England, for example, uh, it was after the First World War because there were no men anymore. But Andrew Taylor still made a point of opening the school to women from day one. There were six women in the first group of students and still was a great supporter of women's rights. And he pushed Alice Patterson, his student, to, to, to go and fight for women's rights. And in fact, there was a petition for the vote of women, the right to vote for women in 1914, and the last signature was still signing. And he wrote on this 20th of June, uh, 1914, I want you to have justice. So from day one, Andrew Taylor Steele was focused really on women. But what is interesting, it's also that 
very early. Remember, the school was opened in 1892. In 1895, he published a little article saying that a complete book, uh, a treatise of, of obstetrics, was completed and will be published. Uh, unfortunately, this book doesn't exist today. And he was saying that this book was meant to finish the seasons of torture of women. So it's interesting to look at what he was saying from the start. Uh, he was against the use of speculum, where he was saying that there is not no need for a steel spindle in the treatment of women diseases. And he was also saying that an osteopath should be able to deliver 1999 children out of thousand without any instruments, that is hands. And it's interesting to look at and to look at what was in fact medicine at the time. Because of course, it's difficult today to imagine uh, to have a good representation of what, what was medicine in the 19th century. Uh, you know, we are at the time of the pioneers, we are in America, in Kirksville, and medicine was not at all what it is today. And I will say things that could me be misinterpreted now, and I would like to say as a preliminary that we have to remember that today we work hand in hand with gynecologists, with surgeons and other medical practitioners. Of course, it's necessary. and we would like uh, even more an integrated approach in medicine. But at the time, it's interesting to go back to the first days and Marion Clark, who was a student of Andrew Taylor Steele, wrote a book in 1904. That was in fact the second edition already of his book. But what does he say there? He says something interesting because it, it could, could make you think. Within the last decade, gynecology has developed into a science distinctly, distinctly surgical when viewed from the standpoint of an abdominal surgeon or a so-called specialist. All chronic conditions are looked upon as surgical. So it's important to remember where gynecology and surgery was. You have to remember that in 1809, the first surgery to remove an ovary, an ovariotomy, was performed in America by a doctor, Mr. McDowell. It was performed, can you imagine, without any asepsis or any form of anesthesia. An assist of nine kilos was removed from the tummy of this patient and the patient survived. So, when you think about that, it seems another planet. You have to realize that in 1867, in London, 76.92%, so 77% of patients were dying following surgery, like ovariotomies or hysterectomies. They were done without any asepsia, any anesthesia. And suddenly, in 1876, everything changed and changed by something we heard every day, 50 times, 100 times in all the medias now, washing of hands. In 1876, washing of hands was introduced and boiling water. They were introduced by Lister in England and the rate of fatalities fell under 13%, 12%. 89, 77% to 13% just by washing hands. It's also important to remember that in 1900, nine out of 10 women were dying during C-section because there was no control of hemorrhage. Of course, today that seems impossible, but that was the time. That was what was happening at the time. And Marion Clark goes on comment on comments of Andrew Taylor Steele. Andrew Taylor Steele said a woman was not made to be maimed by useless surgical experiments. 
And so Marion Clark says that he began to study the human body, its mechanism, the parts and function of all these parts, but particularly the pelvic viscera. And as a result of this study, a new system of therapeutic in general was evolved, which he called osteopathy. While a new system of gynecology in particular was given to the world, making the beginning of an ep epoch. And that is really interesting because it shows how much women's health was present at the start of osteopathy. It shows how much still was focused on women's health. And the first course is in the school. The course was not very long, but there was a, a specific course in gynecology and women's health by Andrew Taylor Steele and Alice Patterson. And it's interesting because Maurice Garrett, who was a student in 1898, took copious notes and these notes have been given to the Museum of Kirksville a few years ago. And it's fascinating to see the writing notes very carefully written by Maurice Garrett on the lectures of Alice Patterson and Andrew Taylor Steele. And it's quite revealing for me. It was very re revealing to realize how much detail and knowledge was present in 1998. And for example, they were describing the ovarian centers. They were describing how to desensitize the fourth sacral vertebra to relax the vagina before uh, an internal treatment. They were describing how the hypogastric plexus is running in front of the body of L5 and describing how to correct L5 to have a neurological input. So it's quite as it was for me a revelation, you know, because that was 19, 1898. And somewhat, somewhere this knowledge was lost. And it's interesting because it's it's fascinating to see how much had been lost and how much had been recovered now. May so I, may I interrupt you at that point, Renzo, because course. I have a question. Of course. Because um, you know, you you said it's, I mean, the roots of osteopathy are in the U.S. and our colleagues are obstetricians and gynecologists in the U.S. Yes. I yes. mean, what what made it happen that all the knowledge is not used anymore, especially in the U.S. because there are not so many yes. osteopaths working hands on. Yes, and the and United States are a good example for the use of C-section as the main approach of birth nowadays. Uh, yeah, that is a very interesting question. Um, I will give you my opinion. It's only my opinion. I, I, I don't know how true it is. But when you look at the evolution of osteopathy in the United States, and by the way, when you look at the evolution of osteopathy today in many different countries, there is one thing that happened. It's that osteopaths wanted to be integrated at all costs. And to be integrated, they accepted to leave parts of osteopathy on the way. I know that when you talk to our colleagues in the United States, they say it's not true. But there are texts from 1938, for example, from somebody very well known, Harrison Fryant, who talks about that. And he said that to be recognized, osteopaths focus on the application of osteopathy and they forget what osteopathy is. Because it's true that if you want to be integrated in the scientific stream, in the mainstream, in the medical stream, you need to demonstrate in a way or another that what you do is, uh, <laughs> is acceptable. And it's far more easy to focus on the application, on techniques, on range of mobility, things that are measurable than on the philosophy, on the approach, on the 
holistic and integrated approach. And I think it's what happened. What happened slowly, progressively, the cause of osteopathy reduced and the cause of medical topics increased. And if you look today in the United States, the cause of osteopathy is reduced to a minimum. And I'm not judging. I'm not judging because our colleagues are doing a, a good work, but I'm not sure it can be called osteopathy. It's the reason they decided to change their title. They don't call themselves osteopath. They call themselves osteopathic physicians. And I know that in many countries in Europe or around the world, there are many osteopaths who would like, in fact, to follow this pathway to be integrated. And, you know, I think it's very dangerous for osteopathy. And uh, I repeat that constantly, but I think it's, it's a very difficult, diff terribly dangerous pathway to follow. Did I answer your question? You did. Maybe I can add one small question. Um, yeah. What do you think? I mean, regulation is, I understand this, this regulation means always you lose something. But yes. when I look in Europe, I mean, the main country for, for gynecological osteopathy is France. What do you think yes. about mentality or, or how I, um, how I handle to 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 have female problems is it uh, are you ashamed of or so i mean in uk i always have the feeling people are a little bit ashamed of and in france is it more open from your experience you know i believe it's relating to what i was saying to start with osteopathy is different in every country and and that is linked to the person or the two or three person who introduced osteopathy in one country, who developed osteopathy. In France, there were, there were a few osteopaths who were very inventive, very bubbly, very, uh, not very respectful of protocols, and, uh, but very inventive. And, and some of them, like Jean-Pierre Barral, for example, to say one name, uh, Jean-Pierre Barral was one of the main promoters in France and his group and his followers were really focused on visceral approach and when you look at visceral, you look at also gynecological cases, etc. Uh, so I think the, the persons who developed osteopathy are the key for the, this answer. But look at the situation in France today. You know, uh, a big part of osteopathy has been rejected by law and osteopaths are not allowed to perform gynecological examinations. They're not allowed to treat pregnant women. It's a catastrophe. And maybe because there was more pressure in, in France for this field. And I hope the legislation will change. We will have all to push for that together. Thank you. Pleasure. So, I would like to go to the potential etiologies as understood by early osteopaths, because if we understand the etiologies of conditions, we can understand the treatment and the treatments become obvious. You know, very often people say, oh, still never describe techniques. If you apply his principles, you know what to do. But it's not totally true, because if you read his books, there, there are descriptions of techniques. And if you look at the notes of Maurice Garrett, there are techniques described. But So there are different etiologies described. The, the first one, it's uh, maybe the mechanical etiology. If you look at steel, very often is represented looking at the femur and looking at the head of the femur. And what is interesting, he is linking this head of the femur to woman's health. And he says, from my experience, I think that much of the diseases to which women are subject is the result of an injury about the hip joint to 
start with. I think here lies the reason of so much un uncomprehended truth concerning the diseases of this region of the body. And of course, it looks a bit strange to, to make a direct link between the hip joint and women's diseases, women's conditions. But when you look at the organization of this lumbopelvic area, when you look at the different links uh, between the hip, the iliacs, the muscles, the organs, you understand that this hip is the key point to condition a good balance in this pelvis. And uh, in fact, when you read still, he was relating the hip to many, many conditions, including cardiovascular conditions by uh, a cascade effect. So it's quite interesting. So for him, the first mechanical etiology was obvious. Uh, if we look after that, we can find other etiologies linked more with the vascular aspect, linked with the arterial supply and the venous drainage. And he says, for example, 1910, he says, if the arterial gates are open and the venous ones are closed, a variation from normal venous drainage results and the detained venous blood becomes stagnant. That we have there the irritation caused by the venous congestion in the parts, which soon passes to inflammation and disease. And it's clear that for him, for him, this balance between the blood supply and the blood drainage is fundamentally important, and that will condition many, many. Uh, imbalances and diseases. And for me, this stasis, this inflammation is really important to approach. After that, he talks early osteopath and even non osteopath talk about connective tissues and vasomotor conditions. And we can look first of all at someone who was not an osteopath, but he was living at the same time, Turbrandt, who wrote a little book on women's diseases. And he says in this little book that the chronic cellulitis develops in the small pelvis superficial and deep connective network and is caused by vasomotor problems. If we go back to Marion Clark, who I was talking about before, he says that fibrosis and sclerosis found at the level of the intrapelvic connective cells is fundamentally important. And if we link that with what Angus Cathy was saying later, 60 years later, uh, we find that in, in the journal book of the AAO 74, that is his contribution to osteopathy, there is a very beautiful article there where it described the descent of the genital tract after birth on a little girl and how the connective cells, indifferentiated connective cells, can be trapped and they can store far too much fluid. And we have there again a link between these connective cells and the drainage in general. After that, of course, we have to talk about posture and gravity as an etiology. And many followers of Andrew Taylor still, like Fryett or Little John, they talk about the gravity and the gravitational forces as one of the main factors impeding circulation and killing our patients. And it's clear that when you look at the cascade of pressures with the pressures in the thorax, in the upper abdomen, lower abdomen, and small pelvis, you understand that there is there a sequence that is very interesting. Uh, there are many things to say on that, but for me, any osteopathic dysfunction can trigger uh, an imbalance in this pressure 
And as a result, this sky ca cascade will have an effect on the small pelvis. So very often, it will be nice to think about that and to try to find the area of entry in the body to solve the real problem and not focus only on the symptoms. Renzo, After that, Renzo, Renzo, yes. is it possible to go back to the, the slide before? With pleasure. May I ask you one question I always ask myself? If you look yes. at the pressure compartments where we see the thorax with negative pressure, the upper yeah. abdomen with yeah. um, neutral pressure and then going to positive, we see yes. that in the pelvis there is negative pressure. Is it for yes. you this negative stands for it's less pressure than in the lower abdomen or do you, is it for you really negative pressure like floating or under pressure? No, 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 you're right. Um, you're right. Uh, I put a negative to be symmetrical <laughs> with the other <laughs> part, <laughs> but to be very visual, so to shock people visually. But in fact, when when you go from the lower abdomen to the pelvis, to the intrapelvic cavity, you have a lot less pressure. But the aim is to be neutral or slightly negative when you come to the little triangle at the end. So the functions will be supported if you have this neutral or slightly negative pressure in the lower end. You know, in the small pelvis, everything, all the functions are relating to pressure. You, you need to have a negative pressure in the bladder to fill up the bladder. But you have a positive pressure in the urethra because it's opening on the outside world, if I can say. And uh, so everything. But what is very important is that you get a huge difference between the lower abdomen and the pelvic cavity, because the pelvic cavity is the center of reproduction and you need to have everything suspended. And You know, for example, many people describe the suspensory system of the organs. I prefer to think about a suspension coming by this neutral or negative pressure that gives space, like under the diaphragm, where the liver is in a neutral pressure because of the suction of the diaphragm, because you have a negative pressure above. And that gives the the liver a neutral state, floating state, allowing all the blood return. And I think this, what I say, it's difficult to prove scientifically, but there is a research that came out in March 2019, so it's not very old, March 2019 by a neurosurgeon. And this neurosurgeon, De Pau, I think it's called, uh, is called, and he looks at the intra-abdominal pressure and its relationship with intracranial pressure and intrapelvic pressure. Because for neurosurgeon, it is fundamentally important to monitor that, because if you have too much intra-abdominal pressure, the deep veins, intraspinal veins, will distribute the blood either to the brain or to the pelvis. And there will not be a smooth regulation and circulation. And uh, I feel that there is a lot of research needed in that, because, of course, it's a neurosurgeon who looks at his own point of interest for his surgeries, but for health in general, it's fundamentally important. Thank you. Thank you. So I was saying neurological. From the beginning, you know, the students of Andrew Taylor Steele, Riggs, for example, William Riggs, uh, who wrote a book. It's not a very good book. You know, it's only in the forgotten books. But it's not very well written. But he says interesting things. You know, in everything you can find interesting things. He says any change in the position of the nerves may irritate an afferent nerve or reflexly interfere with their nutrition and function. 
And he goes on describing the neurological aspect of the pelvic organs with the hypogastric plexus running in front of the fifth vertebra. Of course, today we have changed language, everything has evolved. And if we look at uh, Richard uh, Ruby, for example, he says the impact of spinal, proprioceptive, motor, neural, autonomous and nociceptive facilitation on health. And it's clear that there is a lot of things being developed now, a lot of research going on on interoception and how this relates to general health. But what is interesting also neurologically it's that there is a new surgical approach, a new field in gynecology called neuropelveology. It is being developed by Professor Posover in Zurich in Switzerland. And uh, he has a very interesting approach on all the neurological aspects because that was ignored or let aside by many surgeons. Uh, in London, we have uh, Mr. Peter Barton Smith, who does fantastic work on all that. But anyway, uh, it's interesting to, to think that today gynecology is evolving. And it's interesting also to know that somehow gynecology meets the ideas of Andrew Taylor Steele sometime. And for example, there was a conference at the uh, at the Royal Society of Medicine, um, a conference of the new College of Integrative Medicine in 2016, where uh, Yehudi Gordon, famous gynecologist in England, from England, says that a vast, a very large majority of gynecological conditions are functional in nature and reversible. They should be treated with an integrated approach, integrative approach. And that is interesting because for him and for Mr. Barton Smith also, it's important to include osteopaths and other health professionals in the treatment of women's health. And I think there is a lot to develop on that for the benefit of patients. And talking about patients, you know, I would like to say two words about our teaching clinic. We have a teaching clinic for seven years now in London and a new teaching clinic in Vienna, the VSO. And for me, our clinic and our action in women's health is clearly demonstrated there. We treat many, many different conditions, many different patients with different conditions, dysparonia, endometriosis, adenomyosis, prolapses, chronic pelvic pain, many things, even things I was never thought I will, I will see in an osteopathic clinic. But what is interesting is that our clinic from day one has been fully booked and overbooked with no publicity, no communication, nothing. And that for me shows that there is a real need of our approach. There is a crying need because women are very often mistreated. And there is a lot, a lot of pain, unspoken, silent very often, but there are a lot of lives that are destroyed. And far too many invasive, non-reversible interventions. And I personally feel that we should intervene first to try to see if we can help the functional cases because 80% of the cases for still were, uh, were functional in nature. For Yehudi Gordon, who is now finishing his career, uh, it's the same. He comes to this conclusion, the same conclusion. Let's talk about one or two patients. Just, just a small interruption yeah. because we have a question from Brazil, from Luciana. Is it positive, possible to give more details about the neurosurgeon paper research? Do you have a reference you can post afterwards? Yes, I will. I will post the the references. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I will send you the references. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. It's not directly uh, in relation with what we do. But there is a lot, a lot to take. Yes. If we are 
in research now. Um, yes. you, you now talked about the neurological model. You talked about the, um, the respiratory circulatory model. Um, do you know something new? Because when I did my research, it was hard to find something in the circulatory model that osteopaths measured if the venous yeah. flow improved out of the small pelvis. Do you know something new about this? No, no, there was there were a few attempts. There were different protocols that started, but I don't know anything new on that. Mm -hmm. We have to do it. <laughs> yeah, because it's very important. We always talk about yes. congestion and there is no research. Yes. We should but encourage I'm, everybody to do it. Yes, but, you know, I have made contacts about that and uh, there is a possibility. There is a possibility with uh, echodopplerography, dynamic, uh, 3D echo, uh, 3D dynamic echodoppler. It's, there is a possibility that we will start some uh, research, maybe clinical outcomes, we will see, but there is a possibility. Would be cool. It will take a bit of time. Yes. Can I go to my first patient? Of course. <laughs> I, will, I will start again by talking about uh, two patients, two patients that I found very interesting. The first patient is Ashley. She is uh, 41 years old. And the only thing I knew about her is that she had a complaint, woman's health issue. And I have to say that the first consultation was one of the most difficult of my whole career. When I went to collect her in the waiting room, she was extremely agitated, extremely emotional, and she jumped and started shouting, insulting men, insulting gynecologists, insulting surgeons. And so I pulled her in my room very quickly. And uh, I have to say it was really difficult to extract any, any information because she was totally hysterical. Uh, the only thing I understood is that she could not work since 2018 and that maybe, maybe there was a surgery that created many, many problems. So certainly a surge, I understood that potentially it was a surgery involving the cervix, maybe a let's procedure, maybe there was some, there were some changes on the cells of the cervix. And, but later I heard that it was uh, CIN2 cells. But the surgery was decided, and when she woke up, she felt totally different. And uh, later she wrote to me and she described what she felt. She said that there was a completely hollowness, that everything had shrunk in her pelvis and in her sexual area and that she felt a total disconnection from her femininity, from her sexual area. But what is interesting is that she described in this letter the symptoms. She said that uh, she had sensitive issue, hypoesthesia, etc., but also a heaviness in the pelvis and a atonic pelvic floor and an enormous anger against surgeon and gynecologist. She was, during this first session, you know, I could not ask really question. She was constantly shouting. And the only thing I could do was, at the end, um, I succeeded to have her laying down on, on the couch. And I just did a few minutes, two minutes maybe, of suboccipital inhibition. And I tried to do a frontal lift, but that was all. One month later, she came back for the second session. And when I went in the waiting room, I could not recognize her. She was peaceful. She was beautiful, the hair beautifully done, makeup, etc. And she looked at me and she said, oh, thank you. I don't know what you have done to me, but I'm totally a different person. You reconnected me. And that made me think a lot. And I remembered uh, a chapter 
in Marion Clark book on women's diseases, uh, the second edition from 1904, uh, she, she said that, in fact, during all this period, all this year, she could not apply smells. The sense of smell had disappeared. She was unable to have emotional connection, passion, sensation. And she said something very interesting. She said that after this first session, although she was not totally sexually recovered, she was aware of sensation in her core and a big change in the in the blood flow and the muscle tone of the pelvic floor was totally different. So she could feel she was able to engage the deep lower pelvis muscle. And um, she concluded by saying she was moving to a new chapter a few months later. She was pregnant. She had a beautiful little boy and she's now uh, reconnected. She is part of a movement, international movement of women who went through the same type of procedure and had issues very similar to herself. And that is really very interesting because, of course, medically, this uh, when there are changes in the cells of the at the cervical level, it is an emergency. It is the only way forward. But what I would like is to come back on, on the reasons why, why, why this case is interesting. I looked at uh, the book, I went back to the book of Marion Clark. And what he says, it's very interesting. He connects hysteria, so the the physical symptom linked with a psychological stress or um, uh, incontrollable emotion state. Um, he links that uh, to laceration and injuries of the cervix. And that fascinated me. He says that I have examined patients in which the symptoms were those of nerve waste, nervous, nervousness, hysteria, and many physical symptoms like an atonic pelvic floor, retroversion, and prolapse of the uterus. And that was really interesting because that was 120 years ago. And uh, he described exactly this patient. So uh, I looked a bit beyond all that and I found the research that, they, that came out in December 2018. It was done at the University of Arizona, the Behavioral Neural Science Laboratory, and the author is Heather B. Monte Nelson. And what she did with uh, a research team was to uh, use female rats at dividing uh, these female rats in four different groups. All the rats were taught during two weeks to go through a maze, a very complex maze with water to avoid the smell to different types of um, uh, different types of uh, <laughs> I have the word in French, not in English. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it was a very difficult maze and uh, all the rats were able after two weeks to find automatically their way to the food. Then they divided the rats in four groups. They shaved one group, the abdomen of the rats. They did a laparotomy to the second group. They did an hysterectomy to the third group. And they uh, did nothing to the fourth group. What is interesting, it's that only the rats who had the uterus removed were unable to find their way to find the food. And it was not uh, a few rats, it was 100% of these rats. So the team, the research team, decided to start again the research protocol and they found the same results. And they, their conclusion was that removing the uterus was impacting cognition and short-term memory. And that is really interesting because it shows that the uterus itself can have an effect on functions other than what we know. 
And it's also interesting to note that in the world, and especially in the United, in the United States, uh, a third of the women have their uterus removed before the age of 60. But there are other things. When you look at um, Byron Robinson in 1907 in the book Abdominal and Pelvic Brain, he describes exactly a mass of neurological fibers coming to each side of the cervix and he refers it as the pelvic brain. He is talking about the hypogastric plexus and the fibers of the inferior hypogastric plexus uh, going through the through the ligaments, the uterosacral ligament to come on each side of the cervix. There are other things. Stapfer in 1895, uh, he talks at length in his book about the hemodynamogenic reflex, highlighting the role of the vagus. And then there are more modern research like Collins, Lynn and Pap Papka in 1999 describing the afferent fibers of the vagus going directly from the uterus and the cervix to the brain stem. There are also uh, the relay sensory signals like uh, distension, nociception, vascular state of the uterus and the reproductive tract in Shaban in 2012. So there are many, many things. Another very interesting one, it's the Batson, the Batson uh, venous plexus, this deep vein that connect the deep pelvic area to the inter internal vertebral venous plexus. And these veins go directly to the brain. So that has been demonstrated in 97 uh, by Geldof on the metastatic uh, carriage uh, for men with prostate uh, cancer, but it's also valid on women. And, uh, and there are works that are coming out that demonstrate the link between the different compartments. It's very interesting. After that, of course, there is the, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. And, but all that really, all that demonstrates the huge link between the uterus, the cervix, and the brain, and of course, uh, return. So, uh, if we look at another case, another case that is interesting, uh, this young lady is called Claire, she was born in 82, and she was referred by a general practitioner for musculoskeletal problems. What was interesting is that the only thing noticeable in her medical history was that she had painful period, really painful periods with uh, nausea, numbness in the lower limb. And she cited also an emotional trauma with the sudden death of her father. Uh, she came to see us with a severe pain starting on the left side, uh, going from the ischial tuberosity, but not only going down in the thigh, also going in the inguinal area. And that, that was not really uh, representing the diagnostic. She came with a uh, sciatic pain. The rhythm of the pain was uh, very severe during the night. So we decided to refer her to a gynecologist to have medical examination. And the, she came back with quite a bad diagnosis. In fact, uh, she was diagnosed with severe abnormalities uh, with uh, cells. Um, with cells, and you can see on the colposcopy that was done at the end of April, you can see the change in the cells. You can see looking like warts, looking very inflamed, and you see the inflammation going down there. And the diagnosis was not good. Cell CIN3, dyscariosis, and potentially uh, neoplasia 
in the lymph nodes, so an invasion in the lymph nodes, she was advised to have a surgery immediately, a large excision of the area, let's procedure, uh, and she refused. She refused categorically and uh, she didn't want uh, to be mutilated. That were her words. Uh, she came back and she said, I want to be treated with osteopathy. And of course, that was morally, ethically, it was a huge problem. So we succeeded to have her seeing a second uh, gynecologist and we started the treatment with the monitoring of the gynecologist. She had very regular um, smear test, colposcopy, etc. The only thing, the only treatment was osteopathy and a change in her nutrition. What is interesting is that very quickly the cervix and the tissues change and you can see here the colposcopy at the end of August and you see that the uh, cervix has closed, there are still little patches of inflammation but nothing compared, there are no CIN uh, changes and uh, the symptoms disappeared progressively and the most satisfying thing is that not only the, the pathology disappeared but the periods that were painful for all her life uh, became pain-free and, um, and we are still in contact and she's doing very well. So it's interesting to see that it's possible, it's possible to do a lot uh, when we can and of course we have to work in harmony with gynecologists, we have not to take risk and we have to realize also that in that case, uh, some cases uh, heal on their own. Uh, but anyway, if we talk about a bit about the osteopathic approach and we go back to the history. Uh, in 1950, Robert Truller gave a conference where he was reporting the uh, saying of Andrew Taylor Steele in lectures that he was giving in 1896 at the ASO. And it's interesting because he, what Andrew Taylor Steele say at that time was to give justice to gynecological cases, it is imperative to examine the whole body. Do not concentrate on the zone itself. That is very important for me. Wilfred Riggs also uh, talks about lifting the pressure, removing the stasis, replacing the organs. And uh, if you do that, uh, you will uh, allow the nerves and the vascular walls to keep a good quality. If you don't do that, uh, there will be weakness in both the nerves and the vascular walls and pathology will come. He says, Nature, nature will restore health and vitality if she has the opportunity. Of course, today the approach has changed. We have here a beautiful uh, page prepared by Anja Engel Schulmeier for a conference we had in 2018. And uh, she was presenting uh, uh, the approach on the primary dysmenorrhea, and she was looking at the different models in osteopathy. And of course, there, it's very nice to have these models. Uh, it's a good way to explain. It's a bit theoretical because in reality, they overlap. But it's good to, uh, to see them. So there is the biomechanical approach, the neurological model, the respiratory and circulatory model, bioenergetic metabolic uh, model, and the biopsychosocial model. Uh, it's, as I was saying, we overlap sometimes, all of them, but it's very good to clarify approaches. So what I would say that it's for me, it's always very important to look at the 
global general integrative approach integrating mainly the free system respiratory system like the primary respiratory system in charge of the subtle regulation in the body but also the secondary uh, respiration that is uh, of course, in charge of the cardiovascular system, diffusion of energy in the body. So two vital centers for the individual. But I'm adding a third one. This third respiratory system is linked with the weight bearing areas and it's allowing a breathing of in the small pelvis and uh, allowing the uh, function of reproduction. So two centers for the individual, one center for the species, reproduction of the species. These centers are linked with compartments of pressure and there is a very uh, logical progression uh, between the different compartments and the pressure in every compartment is conditioning a good function. And this system is based on the heat the hip joint that support the whole trunk uh, weight. So any, any osteopathic dysfunction in any of the systems will have an impact on the pelvic uh, pressure. And that is very important because you can see that there is a logic. You have a negative pressure in the thorax, then a neutral pressure underneath the thorax up to upper abdominal, this pressure becomes positive as you go down in the inferior part of the abdomen, but to have a good function, reproductive function, you need to go back to a neutral or negative pressure in the small pelvis. And that is the condition that we have to support and help. So when, of course, I was saying we look at the in at the holistic approach, but we have also to look at the local approach and then the important things. For me, some things are fundamental. For example, the endopelvic fascia contains a lot of indifferentiated connective cells that can store a lot of fluid, but they contain also all the drainage system of the pelvis and the arterial uh, supply for the uterus. They contain also the nerves. So if you have an imbalance in the function of the small pelvis, this compartment can become fibrotic or sclerotic and the function cannot take place. Of course, we have to keep in mind, and that still was explaining that to his students, the hypogastric plexus running in front of L5 and joining the fibers of the inferior hypogastric plexus to go to the cervix. We have to always think about blood supply with the uterine artery going down very low towards the pelvic floor and rising between the two layers of the broad ligament, zigzagging on each side of the uterus to, before joining the ovarian artery. And also we have to keep in mind that this venous plexus that is enormous there is very special. The veins are floating, they are not supported and they are in danger of compression by the different tissues around them. So, of course, we will look at the organs, we will look at the mobility, the motility. But one thing that is very important for me, it's that the positioning, the mobility of these organs is in as a strong correlation with the function of one muscle, the pubococcygeus muscle that is suspended to the sacrum and the coccyx and creates the rectoanal angle. This angle is supporting the cervix and the cervix and the uterus are creating a space for the bladder. So for me, and that is, I know it's 
personal. But for me, that is more important than the suspensory system. Uh, these elements, connective tissue, the neurological supply, the drainage and the arterial supply, and the work, the function of this pubococcygeus muscle allow a good positioning, a good function of the organs. If we, if we look at the techniques, of course, there are all the techniques that we use in osteopathy, but there are also some specific intrapelvic techniques that allow us to work on the fibrotic elements, etc. But what is interesting here is that if we look at the history, we found very old books like Marion Clark, like Woodall, uh, Woodall in 1926 as very good drawing representing the techniques. And what is interesting is that when you look at modern books like Barral, for example, or Olivier Bazin and Marc Nodin, you find very similar techniques and very similar procedure. Of course, the drawings are more visual, more beautiful, but the techniques are the same. So it's uh, interesting to see that there was already a lot of knowledge 100 years ago, and somehow it was a bit lost. And we are very lucky because we found it again and we are using it again. As I was saying to at the start, in the last 40 years, many, many old approaches have been revived, redeveloped and expanded. So the techniques are very important, but we have always to remember that uh, we are dealing with a human body that is incredibly intelligent, adaptive, dynamic, functional and multidimensional. And we have always to be aware that we are unable with our senses to perceive all this complexity. So we are dealing with a, a body uh, that is able to self-balance, to self-heal, and our role is to support optimal health in this body. And for that, of course, we use the structure. We access this complex world through the structure. And it's really interesting because we, the structure is the easy way in and through this structure, we have access to all the dimensions of the human be being. I'm saying the human, I'm using the word human being and not body on purpose. I'm replicating, replicating Friet in 1938 when he gave a talk on the simplicity of osteopathy. But I think what we have to really work on beyond the techniques, it's ourselves. We have to develop qualities that will enable the patient to open and start the process of healing. And for that, I think that the main qualities are humility, because we are dealing with a very complex system, and it's the system itself that has the solution, not us. And then we need to develop empathic awareness. I took this word from Anthony Chila. It's really a beautiful word, not only empathy, but at the same time, awareness. And another word that I use and that I took from Michel Audin, uh, Dr. Michel Audin, it's the non-judgmental presence. If we are able to develop these qualities, we become like a silent witness, allowing the patient to switch from the very overactive neocortex to a more archaic brain, to a more emotional brain, to his, to her limbic system, etc. And I believe that a lot of the healing processes are happening then. As long as we don't succeed to switch the patient from one brain to the other, 
we don't get the opening, we don't get the link. So the patient needs silence. It, the patient needs to feel a very protective environment. And, you know, very often people say when they enter the room, oh, I, I feel already something in this room. It's so peaceful, so quiet. And that for me is very important. The patient has not to feel vulnerable. She has not to feel judged and not feeling observed. And of course, all that is a question of work on ourselves. And I will conclude by saying that we are very lucky because we have time. We have a lot of time. We have our whole life. You know, I will go back to Andrew Taylor Steele. He wrote, I feel that 25 years of constant study of the parts of the man, separated or combined, has prepared me fairly well to enter the higher classes as a beginner to study the active laws of life, to inquire into the hows and the whys of the working and failure of the whole being. And if Andrew Taylor still needed 25 years to enter as a beginner in the higher classes, it means that we have time and we don't have to go too fast. We have to go at our own speed and just practice and study more and more. And I feel that we are very lucky because every patient is a book. We can learn from every case we see. So I will conclude here and I'm thanking you. And it was a pleasure to spend a little bit of time at the Steel Point Cafe with you. Thank you very much, Thank you. Also. My pleasure. Especially for the last words. For me, it's always it's always touching even to see you after so many years of working with such a lot of empathy, with such a lot of passion and still excited about patience. So what's your secret? My, my secret is the patient. <laughs> Every patient is a is a mystery that we have to discover and that is fantastic. Uh, I prefer learning with patients than learning with books myself. I, I have always done that, you know, and fortunately I, I have a good memory of my cases and I can, I can use and re-explore them and understand what I didn't understand on the, at the time of the treatment sometime. And uh, and I I feel that especially in this period, you know, where I cannot work a lot, I see a few patients, but uh, I cannot work as I would like, and I feel a bit frustrated, to be frank, because I love I love what I do. I think that's always we can always feel it when when we listen to you in your lectures, because you always describe your patient as beautiful. And I know yes. that you mean with beautiful, not beautiful women in their appearance, but beautiful as human beings. And for Absolutely. me, it's always inspiring to, to see you still happy with what you're doing and, and yeah, still missing patience after a while. And for this, yes. I want to say thank you for inspiring you. us all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Thank you. So Renzo, we are already looking forward to having you here in January when we start our new women's health course with a group of 21. And we really appreciate if you are joining us in January, hopefully the situation will be okay. So you're looking forward as well, I think. Yes, absolutely. I look forward to, to be in Vienna with you in January and I hope I will be able to fly and to come uh, to Vienna, especially if the UK is dealing a bit better with the crisis. I, hopefully. I think. Hopefully. Yes, hopefully. So Austria is ready for you to come. And I yes. wish you a wonderful evening. And Thank you. Enjoy and your you. time and keep safe. Enjoy. Bye. Enjoy and see you soon. Thank you for tonight. Bye. Bye-bye. 
So I think Renzo is gone now. But um, yes, I think we learned or we got a lot of information from him and a lot of touching, touching sentences we can work with in the future. So, how is it going along or was passiert denn nächste Woche in Café Stillpoint? Sorry for switching into German, but now I'm talking about Café Stillpoint in the next weeks. We decided, also wir haben uns entschlossen, eigentlich das Café Stillpoint jetzt einmal wöchentlich ungefähr zu machen. Für nächste Woche haben wir noch kein Programm, aber wir werden es euch wissen lassen. So, in English, we decided to have Café Stillpoint just once a week from, an, from now on, but we will let you know what our program is for the next days. For today, we will try to record the second part of the lecture or the presentation within the next few days and replace the video and we will put it on YouTube so that everybody can watch it and get all the information um, he wants or she wants. So thank you for watching us tonight. Thank you for your questions, for your participation and have a nice evening. Thank you.